So it's my pleasure today to welcome our very special guest, the Honorable David Lametti, Minister of Justice and Attorney General of Canada, and Senator James Cowan, who is Dine with Dignity's uh, Chair of our Board of Directors. Um, we're anxious to get started, so I'm going to turn it over to Senator Cowan now to get us started. Thank you. Sorry for the technical difficulty. Um, we're delighted to have Minister Lametti with us today, and I'd like to thank him for taking time from his busy schedule to come and join in this conversation today. I'd also like to recognize his valuable leadership and thoughtful work on the issue of medical assistance in dying. Uh, as you know, under his direction, there was a, an extensive consultation with Canadians uh, that took place in the spring of 2020. I think some 300,000 Canadians engaged an extraordinary number. And the bill that we're gonna be discussing today, C7, uh, was uh, the result of, of, that, of that work. And C7 uh, is a critical step forward for Canadians. Uh, and we appreciate, Minister, uh, your dedication and efforts over the past year or so. We're gonna start today with some remarks by the minister on C7. And he'll tell us a bit about the journey and how they got to where we are today. And then uh, we'll have an opportunity to ask the minister to answer some questions that were sent in by our attendees as Helen indicated. So, Minister Lametti, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Senator. Uh, hello, uh, bonjour. Uh, I I'm pleased to be joining you from my home in Montreal, which stands on the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, uh, also known as the Mohawks, uh, but it's also a traditional uh, place of encounter for a number of different uh, Indigenous peoples, First Nations, uh, in particular the Cree, the Anishinaabe, uh, the when here on Wendat and and uh, and Métis peoples. So an honor to join uh, Senator uh, Cowan and Helen Long, who is the CEO, as you know, of Dying with Dignity Canada, to talk to you about what I can happily call former Bill C7, uh, which received royal assent on March 17th. I don't have to tell you what a significant milestone this is. Uh, dying with dignity knows. In fact, you put it best when you called royal assent a triumph of compassion and choice. I could not have expressed that uh, better myself. Uh, lorsque je prends du recul, au-delà des décisions judiciaires et des processus législatifs, je sais que nous sommes dans la bonne voie. Tout au long de notre démarche, nous n'avons jamais perdu de vue le fait que lorsqu'il y a question d'aide médicale à mourir, Il est question d'humains, de familles. Il est question de personnes qui souffrent énormément. Pour cette raison, il a fallu aller de l'avant sans tarder, mais en étant profondément conscient du poids de nos décisions. Votre organisation a défendu avec vigueur et passion les intérêts des Canadiens qui méritent la liberté de choix et des soins de fin de vie de qualité. Je vous suis reconnaissant de votre travail et, je, et de votre soutien uh, sans faille durant le processus. Now, this bears repeating in English. Dying with Dignity has been a passionate and vocal advocate for Canadians who deserve quality, end-of-life choice and care. I'm grateful to all of you for your tireless work throughout this process. I would like to take a bit of your time today to look back at the journey that got us here. It is a journey that has been emotional, and challenging for thousands of Canadians, uh, and probably including most of us in this discussion today. Among those Canadians are some people whose names are now familiar and forever linked to the question of MAID. That is because they decided to speak up, not only for themselves, but also for those who could not. I'll begin with a reference to two of them, Lee Carter and her husband, Hollis Johnson. They decided to challenge the laws that prohibited medically assisted dying in Canada after Lee's mother had to leave the country for the procedure. En 2015, la Cour suprême a rendu une décision unanime et sans équivoque les dispositions législatives interdisant l'aide médicale à mourir pour les adultes qui y consentaient, vouées à d'intolérables souffrances causées par des problèmes de santé graves et irrémédiables portait atteinte aux droits garantis par la Charte. Cette décision a entraîné l'élaboration de l'ancien projet de loi C-14, adapté en juin 2016, lequel prévoyait la modification du Code criminel pour créer la première loi canadienne 
en matière d'aide médicale à Montréal. Cette loi crée des exemptions à l'égard de certaines infractions du code criminel dans le but de permettre aux personnes en fin de vie qui éprouvant des souffrances intolérables de mourir paisiblement. Avec l'aide d'un médecin ou d'un infirmier praticien, il, il pouvait dorénavant faire le choix d'une mort paisible plutôt qu'à l'agonie. Il s'agissait d'une modification législative d'envergure qui illustrait la volonté de nombreux Canadiens de décider de la manière et du moment de leur mort lorsque la souffrance euh, deviendrait intolérable. Un premier pas historique a été franchi. Toutefois, nous avons toujours eu l'intention de revoir le cadre de l'aide médicale à mourir et de l'améliorer, ce qui était clairement énoncé dans l'ancien projet de loi C-14. The parliamentary review of the legislation was slated to begin in June 2020. Our expectation was that it would involve a study of the findings from independent reviews of three areas where made is not yet permitted or not permitted. Specifically, requests made by mature minors, requests made in advance of an eventual loss of decision-making capacity, and requests based on a mental illness where someone is not otherwise nearing the end of their life. You will remember that all of these areas were outside of the scope of former Bill C-14. We decided that they needed more time for study and debate. Trois ans plus tard, deux autres Canadiens ont eu le courage de dénoncer la cause exigeante la mort prévisible, la clause exigeante la mort prévisible. Jean Touchon et Nicole Gladu n'étaient pas admissibles à l'aide médicale à mourir, malgré leur souffrance, car leur mort naturelle n'était pas prévisible. En septembre 2019, le jugement Touchon de la Cour supérieure du Québec déclarait ce critère anticonstitutionnel. Notre gouvernement a décidé de ne pas aller en appel. Nous savions que le long processus juridique ne ferait que prolonger les souffrances de nombreux Canadiens. Nous avons plutôt décidé de changer les critères d'admissibilité à l'aide médicale à mourir pour s'assurer que la loi était uniforme partout au pays. Before bringing forward the legislation, we carried out a nationwide consultation to gather Canadians' thoughts on the issues raised in the Truchon ruling. We also wanted to gauge if there, were, if there was consensus on other issues related to MAID and on which we could therefore move more quickly. Mes collègues, les ministres Aïdou et Qualtro, et moi-même, avons consulté des praticiens, des chercheurs, des défenseurs des droits des patients et des personnes ayant vécu euh, de près cet enjeu à l'occasion de 10 tables rondes organisées dans les villes de partout au pays. Nous avons aussi directement rencontré les défenseurs des droits des personnes handicapées, des partenaires autochtones et, et d'autres intervenants ayant une bonne connaissance de ce dossier crucial. Bien sûr, c'était avant que la COVID-19 ne change notre monde. De sur quoi plus de 300 000 Canadiens nous ont fait part de leur point de vue lors d'une consultation publique en ligne ce qui a grandement orienté nos travaux et révélé à quel point nos opinions et l'exercice de la médecine ont évolué depuis que l'aide médicale à mourir est offerte, donc depuis 2016. Ces consultations ont guidé la proposition de modification dans l'ancien projet de loi C7 et nous ont mené là où nous en sommes aujourd'hui. So we're at Bill C7. The revised law respects the autonomy of Canadians to decide for themselves when their suffering has become intolerable, while at the same time protecting those who are vulnerable. More importantly, or most importantly, it expands the eligibility for MAID by removing the requirement that a person's death be reasonably foreseeable. So this directly responds to the Truchon case, uh, which had held this requirement to be not constitutional. The legislation establishes two tracks, each within its own set of procedural safeguards within the federal framework on MAID. One for patients for whose death is reasonably foreseeable and, and largely based on, on the, the, the 2016 regime, and the second for those whose natural death is not. Under both tracks, patients must be in an advanced state of irreversible decline, must have an, ir an incurable illness, disease, or disability, and must be suffering intolerably as a result of one of these conditions. 
For those whose death is not reasonably foreseeable, a more robust set of safeguards is now in place. The people who choose to seek me are experiencing enduring unbearable suffering. And we know that their families and loved ones often suffer alongside with them. The changes that are now in place allow for compassionate action while also protecting those who are particularly vulnerable. Individuals whose death is reasonably foreseeable and who have been fully assessed and approved will now have the option to waive the requirement to provide final consent immediately before receiving MAID. This is what is commonly referred to as the Audrey Parker Amendment. Audrey Parker chose to end her life earlier than she otherwise had wanted to out of fear that she would be unable to provide final consent on her chosen day. Her outspoken and pervasive, persuasive ad advocacy for this change now means that no one will be faced with that impossibly unfair and difficult choice. All of the changes to the MAID framework are the direct result of consultations with Canadians, including practitioners, academics, organizations such as Dying with Dignity, and those with lived experiences right across Canada. So again, I want to thank you for your steadfast collaboration on this front. It is also important to highlight that for the next 24 months, individuals suffering solely from mental illness will be excluded from eligibility. Minister of Health Patty Haidu and I will initiate an expert review on protocols, guidance, and safeguards for made for persons suffering from mental illness, and the experts' recommendations will be presented to Parliament a year from now. Rest assured that your voices and the voices of thousands of other Canadians will be heard as part of this process. I encourage you, therefore, to bring your views forward to the Joint Parliamentary Committee that will study several made issues, including mental illness as a sole criterion. Nous sommes conscients que les opinions des Canadiens divergent encore au sujet de cette question très personnelle. Je comprends leurs inquiétudes et celles des nombreux Canadiens qui veulent s'assurer que la législation affirme la valeur inhérente et l'égalité de chaque vie humaine. Soyez rassurés que je n'accepterai pas moins. I would also like to again express my sincere gratitude for your engagement and your determination to push for freedom of choice for all Canadians to decide for themselves when their suffering has become intolerable, all the while protecting the vulnerable. So I look forward to your questions today. Thank you, uh, Merci. Uh, over to you, uh, Senator Cowan. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Minister. Uh, I'm just, I, I think the just, <laughs> We're ready to go. Um, thank you, Minister, uh, for that very excellent summary in both of our official languages. Uh, one of the issues that our supporters consistently raised with us is the issue of, it, of advanced requests. And uh, you'll recall that uh, back in 2016, uh, the Joint Parliamentary uh, Committee recommended uh, that advanced requests be allowed. And there was a Senate amendment that um, was uh, not accepted by the government, but, and as you said, that the, the issue is one that was subject to the study by the Canadian Council and the academies and will be addressed by the joint committee. But I think there is, there is there's still some confusion about what is, say, the difference between an advanced request uh, and the sort of um, removal of the final consent that uh, is uh, dealt with in, in Audrey's amendment. So, can you give us a sense of your view of how those come together and how you anticipate, uh, when you anticipate that we might be able to have uh, access to uh, uh, advanced requests for medical assistance to die? Thank you, Senator. It is indeed one of the things that, that Canadians in our consultation, uh, in you know the, the 300,000 people who participated online, it's one of the things that virtually everybody had a very strong opinion on. And, and I will say the majority in favor um, of some form of advanced requests. The, the difference between what we have done uh, is, is a question of time frame. So what we have done is, is in the Audrey Parker scenario, uh, so the, the waiver of final consent, it's in, a, it's in an end of life scenario. So it's only in that scenario. It's where a person has already been assessed and approved for MAID. Um, and the, the there was um, 
there was a, a waiting period, which we we uh, we have now removed uh, again for the same reason, just causing people to suffer. But what it what it allows. So the person has been approved. Person has, has sought made um, has been approved, um, and would like to set a date in case they lose consciousness, and then and then their 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 made uh, provider would still be able to fulfill that request. It's in a very short time frame. Again, in that end of life scenario, um, and again, it just takes away that that fear. People told us. People told us that they were afraid of losing that capacity. Sometimes they weren't taking their their, their, their pain medication and other sorts of things, uh, other, other taking other sorts of measures, which just heighten their suffering in order to be able to make that final uh, determination. So this takes away that pressure. And, I th and, and really, uh, I think Audrey Parker's testimony was quite compelling uh, at the time. And many of us, I think, were moved by that. The, the ad advanced request has a larger time frame, and it is... There are a couple of different, uh, different typical scenarios. One is you have you, you become diagnosed with an illness that has a that has a, a known prognosis, and you, you're going to suffer cognitive decline or 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 other sorts of, of conditions which will put you at a place where you are suffering intolerably, although you're not there yet. Um, should one be able to say when I reach this stage in that prognosis? Um, I would like to, you know, when I can't recognize my family members or, or I can't recognize my spouse or, or it's something like that. Um, so that's, that's much further projected into the future. There's a more wide scenario, um, which uh, su supported amongst others by, by, by notaries and uh, in particular in Quebec, where one could, one could create a document saying, um, Whatever the case, this isn't this doesn't attach necessarily to a known prognosis. But whatever the case, if I lose the ability say, to recognize my family members, then I authorize X number of people to make um, to make a decision on my behalf. So those are the kinds of advanced requests that might be envisaged uh, under law. They're they're more complex. They're they're further projected in the future. They often require other people to make decisions. Um, uh, certainly required doctors perhaps to make decisions that, and, and perhaps doctors that didn't know the patient um, directly in, in the very intimate maids settings we've, we've currently seen. And, and Dying with Dignity is very familiar with that. They, they, you have done, uh, is it still okay to say yeoman's work? <laughs> You'll work uh, in, in helping people uh, through that process. So it's it's a different set of issues. It's 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 much more complex. It's very obviously people are suffering, uh, families, and and so it it needs more study. And and that's what we will do uh, uh, as as we should uh, with with the next step of the parliamentary review, um, and and really initiate that 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 frank discussion that we need to have. Right. I've said many times, Minister, that the the that study that the Canadian Council of the Academies did on that specific topic provides a great review of the literature and the current data on the issue. And it is a complex issue, I agree. Uh, so folks who are interested in delving into that issue uh, it, um, more deeply, um, that, that's a well where, where document well worth looking at it. It's on the, I'm not sure if it's on your departmental uh, website, but it's certainly on the website of the Canadian Council of the Academies and makes, makes good reading. So it's uh, there's a lot of material there. That's a great place uh, to start. Yeah, uh, I think the next question that uh, that has sort of in terms of importance and uh, understanding of our supporters and uh, is the issue of uh, an understanding of whether uh, how folks with dementia or Alzheimer's uh, would qualify for MAID. And uh, we know that uh, there is the specific exclusion that, that you mentioned in, in C7, uh, which def defers for two, year, for two years the um, mental illness uh, as a, as, as, or, or excludes those whose sole underlying condition is a mental illness from accessing MAID. But what about those who have uh, uh, dementia or Alzheimer's? What's, uh, how does that diagnosis fall into that uh, discussion? Well, I guess the answer is it could. Uh, there, as I've just said, there's no 
there, there's no possibility yet for advanced requests. So if, if it's a declining neurocognitive condition, um, it, you can't decide now uh, for made X number of years down the road or when you reach a certain, a certain stage or, or, or uh, evolution in the, in the, the, uh, uh, the, uh, in the thick course of the, of the illness. Um, that being said, there isn't, there isn't an exclusion now. I mean, if, if uh, and in particular with, uh, as a mix with other factors, but certainly if, and, and uh, I have to say that our medical profession has been really responsible uh, in this regard, I think highly responsible in working with their patients and, and uh, in particular, and as, as well as, as family members around, but it is, it is a patient's decision. So working with the patients, if someone, you're not excluded because of a neurocognitive uh, right. condition. And so if you can meet the criteria uh, in, in, uh, in particular, up until now, it's been in the end of life scenario, um, that, could, uh, that could be legitimate uh, and, and could uh, entitle one to have made. And, and the same is, is also possible. Um, again, I'm not a doctor, so I'm not going to speculate on, on individual kinds of cases, but but it is still, it is also possible in the non-end of life scenario that one could meet the criteria with, with a, a neurocognitive condition, provided one has the capacity to consent right now and right. one fulfills the criteria. So um, it is possible. We, we, as you know, there was an amendment trying to define or differently define neurocognitive conditions from mental illness. We think there's enough already there uh, to distinguish between the two already in the in, in the law and in the materials around the law, the, the, the legislative record, uh, parliamentary records. Um, we don't, just to say a few words on mental illness, we, we understand the seriousness of mental illness as an illness. There's, there's, there, there's no slight here. Um, no, it, it is simply because of, of the, the difficult challenge, particular challenges to mental illness that require more study, expert study, and, and there is leadership uh, within the parliamentary group, within the House and in the Senate, um, and we'll we'll get to uh, I think a responsible result uh, in that regard uh, within the time period. It will be tough, but we'll we will make it, and and I think uh, people will understand uh, the, the seriousness with which we have we have looked at uh, mental illness as a sole criterion. And of course, mental illness can be uh, coupled with another criteria already, and that's already that's already happening. Because the exclusion only provide only uh, provides for the case where mental illness is the sole underlying case, and often, as you say, uh, there's a comorbidity of of situations which results in the kind of suffering. But I think it's important for folks to understand that they, that for these neurocognitive disorders, if they if those those folks do in fact meet the criteria that are set forth in the legislation, and uh, then they they could qualify, but it is, as I think you right as lawyers, we have to make it clear that this is a, these are clinical decisions that physicians make, health professionals make, and uh, they are not decisions that are made by, by courts. Or, or decisions made lightly. I mean, there are a number yeah. of, of sort of horror scenarios that are presented out there. And um, it, it, it's simply not, it, it's from what, from, from all the consultations we've done and all the people we've spoken to, certainly you know this from your experience in, in, in dying with dignity. The, this is a, a very serious decision that is only taken under the most tragic of circumstances yeah. and the most personal circumstances. And it's not, a, it's not the case that somebody just walks in off the street and says, no. I would like to have made. I mean, that, that, and, and, that's, and that's a scenario that I think we need to, we need to push back on um, firmly, but gently. Uh, to say, well, no, actually, it's not like that. This is how it, it is, actually, and yeah. and it is being done very responsibly. Again, I salute the, the the medical profession and other support services that that exist in this regard. They've done a really good job, and we have four or five years of experience now, and uh, absolutely no indications that I'm aware of of alleged misuse or or. Uh, uh, Poor decisions. It's 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 worked it's worked remarkably well, and I think C seven is as we've said is a is a significant improvement. Can I turn for a moment to to Audrey's amendment? I guess as a, a Nova Scotian, I can take particular uh, pleasure in that because I knew Audrey Parker, and I and uh, I know how passionately she uh, felt about this, and how delighted she would be 
if she knew that uh, this this progressive step was now bore her name. But can you give us some sense of uh, how far you see the, uh, the the period be or how long the period could be between the the date that one is assessed and approved, and then the date when you're you can for which you can waive uh, final consent. The, the bill now says that you have to have not only identify the the future date on which you want to have um, your your medical assistance in dying, but you also make have to make sure that the medical practitioner is prepared to provide it on that date. Is there any sense of of how long that period could be between the the uh, the date of of uh, assessed and approved and the date that in the future in which you would receive it, notwithstanding that you might have then lost your capacity? I, I, I can't really, again, I'm not a doctor. Um, what I can say is that you still have to fall within that end of life scenario and, the, yeah. and those end of life uh, criteria. Um, and that, and, and I'm, I'm not gonna second guess the judgment of, of a medical practitioner in that regard. You know, he or she will know uh, understanding the prognosis and 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 under and understanding their patient, it, it it is it is obviously a shorter time period uh, because it's still in that end of life scenario. But I I'm not, I, I would be uh, it would be a mistake on my part to fix to fix. Right. But there is, kind no, of there is no fixed time. period. There's no fixed period. Well, that's right. That's right. And and we 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 deliberately didn't uh, simply because we're we're leaving it we're we're leaving it really where it should be, which is. It, the, in that doctor-patient relationship. Yes. And the issue of, again, raising the issue of Alzheimer's or dementia, these are again, um, I think as you said earlier, providing people reach the, meet the eligibility criteria that are set forth. Um, there's no, they're not precluded from accessing uh, medical assistance in dying because the condition which causes that suffering is, is uh, a neurocognitive Disorder. Yeah, that's right. They they have to be able to consent. Uh, but again, it's 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 it it, it is within uh, that the doctor patient relationship whether they fit into one or other of the, of the scenarios and meet and meet the criteria in each. Uh, I'd like to just turn to uh, an issue which uh, has been raised by many of our supporters and and one which certainly surprised me as I watched uh, and read the uh, debates in the House and the Senate, the extent to which. Uh, concerns were expressed by uh, uh, spokespersons for the disability community, uh, some disabled persons themselves, others who uh, uh, were uh, from racialized communities or indigenous communities who um, understood uh, that perhaps the C7 in particular, the amendments that were proposed in C7, but uh, I think in general, the whole medical assistance in dying regime um, was uh, was threatening to them. Let me use that that term uh, that they felt that they felt almost in a way that whereas I think the intent of the bill was to make it less discriminatory, open it up for more individuals uh, subject to safeguards. Uh, some groups and some individuals felt very strongly. Uh, obviously very passionately that the reverse was the case, that this was discriminated against them. It was devaluing person, the lives of persons with disabilities, as an example, or that it was not being presented uh, or portrayed in a culturally sensitive way to uh, communities. And I must say that that surprised me, the tone of that. Um, I wonder if you have a comment on that. And um, I know we're at Dying with Dignity, we're, we're looking into this to see how we can uh, be a more, have a more effective outreach to those groups and un, try to understand their concerns and, and to respond to them uh, as best we can. But um, would you have any comments on those, uh, on those points, Minister? Yeah, uh, well, let me begin on, on, on uh, racialized communities, uh, indigenous communities. So I mean, we did our best to outreach in the time that we had and we'll continue uh, working forward and we'll get better data. Uh, part of the bill is to get better uh, disaggregated data uh, to see the impact uh, and to make sure that there aren't uh, unintended consequences of, uh, of what we've done thus far. Um, and we'll continue uh, with that dialogue. With, with respect uh, to the, uh, the disability community, 
Um, I think what we all have to realize is, is that in, in, in many circles, this uh, made is perceived as an existential threat, particularly non end of life. So in a sense that that first, uh, end of life scenario under Bill C-14 was, was in and of itself seen as a safeguard by the disability community uh, because it, it restricted the class of people um, uh, to, to people who are nearing death. And, and you know, the classic cases are, are, are you know, t t terminal cancer and, that, and, and, and those sorts of very tragic uh, scenarios. When, when we were, and, and, you know, a number of us at the time thought that it was still too restrictive, as you know. Um, but but when the court certainly uh, rendered that decision in in 2019, the, the Quebec Superior Court, it opened the door to a non end of life scenario, and so we had to very much grapple with this this question. Um, and we did our best. Uh, we consulted, and in fact, I think it's it's fair to say the structure of C7 itself reflects those consultations with the leadership of the disability community because it creates uh, a, a, a more stringent set of safeguards in the non-end of life scenario to prevent a decision from being made rashly um, and to make sure that options options for living, options for life uh, and, and, and the kinds of supports uh, one is entitled to have to be at least raised uh, with the person um, by, uh, by the caregivers um, and by the, 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 the MAID providers as part of their obligation to the patient. And so, uh, and so there is a stringent set of criteria. And from, a, from I suppose, an autonomy perspective, which, which I share with you, uh, Senator, um, th this seems to make sense and seems to be logical and seems to be explicable. That being said, the non-end of life scenario still remains a, a threat. Um, and I think, or perceived to be a threat, and I think what we what we need to do, certainly as a public as a public figure, and you're a public figure, I'm going to keep supporting um, uh, support for uh, people living with disabilities uh, and the other the other uh, indicia of, of uh, very real indicia of social equity and and the ability to live uh, with dignity. Um, in addition to having this regime, which allows one to choose uh, to die with dignity. Um, so I'll continue to do that, but also there, there is just a, an understanding that sometimes we need to we need to think about our language in a in a very sensitive way. I, I've stopped saying I'd rather be dead. You know, if that happened to me, I'd rather be dead. I, I've I've now come to realize that for a lot of people that is a threat, and and so I don't say that anymore. I say I would decide at the time based on on what happened uh, and what was in front of me. So. It's really just a matter of all of us, and and you, you're already good at this in, in dying with dignity. You're, you're very sensitive to the needs of people. We all need to do that, and we all need to do it as a society, and and really work at making life an option and making made an option, and, and allowing for autonomy autonomy to be exercised in a very meaningful way. And and I think we can accomplish that. Um, I think we will get to a better place because of C7, better dialogue because of C7, and we'll just continue to push forward. Yeah, and obviously in the course of the parliamentary review, there will be an opportunity for others to, uh, to uh, engage. I wanted to, before I come to the parliamentary review, I wanted to talk, go back a bit to the, the expert panel that uh, is to be struck um, to deal with the, Mental, with the issue of mental illness, and I just forget as we speak within what time frame that is. If it's fairly short, that uh, that can can you tell us sort of when that will be set up and how you are not I, you're not in a position to announce the panel, but how what what kind of people will you have on that panel, and what would be the the the, the mandate um, of of that of that of that panel. Well, the, the, the panel is a professional one in a sense, a professional and ethical one. Um, we are looking to populate the panel, if you will, with, with expertise in psychiatry, uh, other, other areas uh, of, of, um, uh, of the profession. So people who have, have uh, experience with made assessment provision, uh, people who are experts in law and ethics uh, and, and who have experience with the various uh, regulatory bodies um, that, uh, that exist in the medical profession and in particular the 
in, in psychiatry. It, its purpose really is to help develop practical standards that we can then, uh, we can then in some way frame uh, legally. Um, but it, but also, you know, working again with the, with the provincial experts because a lot of this will fall in in the in not not so much under criminal law, but in in um, in health, and so part of provincial domain to to work through a, a set of standards that that um, allow people who have mental illness as a sole criterion to access made. Uh, but to make sure that that process is done is done safely and sensitively, um, and uh, and in a way that will allow medical practitioners too to participate with confidence, knowing that that they're helping the patient and they're not breaking the law. But but I, I wanted to make the make sure the point was clear that this is a an expert panel, it's a professional panel. It's not um, it's not a public panel. I, uh, the way that are, I, yeah. Yeah, they'll decide how they want to run their panel, right. uh, um, whether they want to hear witnesses. I'm sure they'll go out and consult as well um, uh, on their own. But but they'll they'll decide their own uh, their own process. Um, they they will likely hear uh, from other uh, from other experts or 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 members of the general public, and they will they will uh, put together a report within a year. So um, uh, roughly April uh, uh, April 2022. Uh, they will have to produce a report, which will become public. Right. Uh, we will table it in the House of Commons, uh, that report. And then the Parliamentary Committee, uh, which, uh, which will also have sat, will also have looked at mental illness as one of its, um, as, as one of its as areas of study. Um, and then it will ultimately be up to the government and parliamentarians uh, to put together um, uh, a draft legislation uh, uh, and a bill uh, before the House of Commons um, to operationalize the three areas and 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 uh, and also I suppose to react and incorporate what the what uh, or otherwise modify what the, uh, the the expert panel has done. Right. You mentioned the the parliamentary review, which is the next point I wanted to come to. That uh, as it was a few years ago, it will be a joint. House Senate uh, um, committee and that committee presume as it will have those those topics as its mandate, but the way in which it will conduct its its affairs will be up to the committee. But there will be, I'm sure, uh, opportunity for witnesses to present testimony uh, to the committee, and the committee will hold public hearings and then will will file a report as they did as they did before. And I'm. Just as a personal note, I'm pleased to see that it's a, a joint committee. Uh, I think that uh, it worked well last time, and I'm sure it will work uh, equally um, well this time. Minister, what obviously, the, as I said, there will be an opportunity for individuals to provide input to the joint committee and perhaps uh, to the expert panel as they, uh, as they do their work. But is there a way in which um, you see Canadians um, larger individual Canadians who want to contribute to the discussion on on this process how 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 can they do that how would you see that taking place you had the extensive public consultation in the spring of 2020 and was the number 300,000 uh, Canadians who engage is an extraordinary number uh, so it's it's obviously a, a a topic which engages Canadians and uh I think our, our supporters would like to know how they can engage, perhaps individually, perhaps through uh, through Dying with Dignity Canada, uh, to in, in these in the process of these reviews and these continuing consultations. Well, obviously, the first stage formally is is the parliamentary committee. I, I can't imagine a scenario where the committee won't hear uh, testimony uh, from Canadians. Uh, some of it in person, most of it in writing, and so there, there is there is that first opportunity. But after that, there is the parliamentary process, uh, which which will take uh, which will take the committee report, which will take the expert report, which will craft a bill, uh, and then that will go through the usual stages: of first reading, second reading, uh, committee uh, committee hearings. The committee will likely hear, and and as you said, and I think I think you're absolutely right. Um, there is a great deal. 
uh, there is a, a great deal of interest in this and people will want to weigh in. And, and, and the Senate will also go through its uh, processes, including committee and also likely including hearings. So there will be ample opportunity for Canadians uh, either as individuals or as part of groups uh, to weigh in and, and make their voices heard. I, given my experience, I think they will. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and in fact, we, we, you know, we obviously look forward to that. Um, this will be an intense process. Uh, it will take us through the next few years. And, um, and uh, you know, I look forward to those engagements. Um, I, I will, if I might uh, suggest to all Canadians, not just members of Dying with Dignity, uh, but, but everyone across, uh, across the spectrum of, of, of ideas with respect to MAID, is that we need to be respectful uh, and, and um, dignified, if you will, in the manner in which we participate in these debates, because they are, they are sensitive. They're life and death issues. They're, you're, you, we're often talking to people who, who have had family members go through MAID or, or practitioners who have had to make ethical decisions that have often been very difficult. And, um, and while a, a number of those who have come through the experience recount how life affirming it is and how positive it has been, it is still sensitive and we need, we need, to, take, uh, we need to take those sensitivities into account. So I would, I would welcome everybody to participate, but I would ask everyone to, to really tune up their emotional intelligence and, uh, and be sensitive uh, to the, not just what they're saying, but the manner in which they're saying. I think, it's, I think that's very, very important. I think that it is, as you say, a, a very sensitive, a very emotional issue, a very personal issue. And uh, sometimes emotions uh, get people carried away. So I think it's terribly important that we do keep respectful of the views of others because we are talking about individual choice. We're not talking about anybody making decisions for anybody else. We're talking about one's individual decision. Um, Minister, there was an amendment uh, which I think came from the Senate, which was accepted by the government with respect to the collection of, of uh, data um, relating to race and, uh, and uh, ethnicity. Um, I think there's been some misunderstanding as to why that would be. Can you tell us why you uh, felt that this was an appropriate um, type of data to be collect to be collected and what will it be used for in what way in what way will it be used well thank you and it, it's important to clarify this uh, certainly uh, with respect to the discussion around made um, on bill c7 and, and made as we move forward also with with respect to what we've seen with covid uh, and and what we've lived for the past 13 months um, we have had gaps in the kinds of data that have been uh, gathered uh, in the health sector, uh, and, and in this case in particular with respect to MAID, we, we don't, and, and we, we have become much more sensitized too in particularly recent months on the, the idea of, of, of the potential for systemic racism inbuilt into systems and decisions. Again, they're not they're not advertent, they're not intentional, but there are things that, that we sometimes decide that can have a disproportional impact on one group or another group and, and can be, an, and can be uh, an exemplar of systemic racism. So by gathering the data, we'll be able to see, by gathering better data and getting disaggregated data with respect to who is accessing MAID or, or how it is being used or, or and, and uh, et cetera, et cetera, uh, we'll, we'll have a better picture. And if there is a disproportionate impact uh, on a particular group, um, a racialized group, a particular First Nation or Indigenous group, um, it, we will have a better picture and we'll be able to ask ourselves why or how, uh, and, and we'll be able to explain it if it's explicable and we'll be able to rectify it if it's something that needs to be rectified. Um, or it may, it may also explain a lack of access, the opposite, uh, and, and that may have other uh, consequences that we need to address in terms of providing, in terms of providing made as, as a, effectively as part of our healthcare uh, end of life offerings or, or, or illness offerings. Um, so all of that will help us do better um, and, and not do unintended harm, but also do better in what we, we hope to do better. Uh, and again, this is something that has been raised by, by racialized groups in a variety of different contexts, including this one. Right, right. The um, 
Somebody sent in a note, which I hadn't really thought about before, but uh, makes good sense. And that is that we talk about MAID being, uh, uh, it's a health, it's a health uh, procedure uh, and it's, it's concerning people's health and suffering and that sort of thing. And somebody said, well, if that's the case, why would it be in the criminal code? And I guess, I guess it was obvious to me, but I, that, that's a good question. I think perhaps it would be worthwhile just hearing your views on that. I guess you have to put on your lawyer's hat and think and think backwards, <laughs> which which is what we often do. Um, the the uh, providing uh, uh, assistance in suicide is a criminal code offense. So you you have, I suppose, a right to die, a right to suicide. Uh, but but aiding someone else is is still a criminal offense in Canada. And so, without the legislation. C14, the original C14 and C7, what they did was carve out exceptions to that rule that you, you couldn't help someone uh, end their life. Uh, it provides the circumstances in which you would you could and not attract uh, criminal punishment. Um, and so we're still working within that paradigm. Uh, and, and as I said, you really have to think backwards through that. The, uh... I think those are the, all the questions that I had, Minister. Is there any um, that have been sent in? I don't know whether Helen has any that have come in during our conversation. Oh, we have lots that have come in during our conversation, but we've dealt with as many as we can. Uh, maybe one question, Minister, in the event that there's an election, um, you know, I think we're all hearing speculation about that. How does that impact what is supposed to happen as a result of Bill C-7 and, and the timelines for that? Good question. I, I think it's fair to say it, it wouldn't it wouldn't impact the, the expert committee. Um, it wouldn't impact the expert committee. It would likely mean that the parliamentary committee would would be on uh, hold for that period of time during the election. Um, and I suppose would even be I, I'm not not certain. Probably subject to change depending on the con, you know if, if a committee member gets unelected on the on the house on the house side. Um, in the course of an election, but it, it, it won't affect the, the expert committee. They'll do their work um, and we'll see what happens. We're not, I'm not speculating on elections and and um, actually none of the parties are at this stage. There are some other things that are rather important that we need to do yeah. with, such as COVID-19. But uh, but uh, but if if it does happen, we'll deal with it, uh, but, but it will be up to parliamentarians to redouble their efforts to make sure we meet these deadlines. Great. And uh, what would you say to those who would say that, you know, dis despite the steps forward, C7 didn't go far enough? Any any final thoughts for them? Well, I understand that sentiment uh, and I, I understand it very well. I, I think we're moving in in step with Canadian society, uh, step by step. Uh, Senator Cowan referred to this obliquely. Uh, I'll be more explicit. The biggest thing that's changed since 2016 is the attitude of Canadians. I mean, it 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 is it was really something to see in the course of consultations. People who were formally opposed in 2016, who are now, you know, this has worked. This has really worked well. Uh, we will help you with next steps. And so bringing bringing people along. Um, and so. There, there is, there's certainly a legitimate view that we we could have gone further or that we should have gone further. Uh, but we are, we are moving. Uh, I think with um, a concerted effort, and I think it's moving, um, continues to move, and uh, and I think uh, Canadians are are quite accepting of the pace that we're moving. Sometimes, sometimes people say that you know if you offend some people that think you have you've gone too far and some people on the other side think you haven't gone far enough you may have gotten it just right well my twitter account seems <laughs> seems to uh, seems to be living proof of that but so, it is i think it's i think it's astounding the 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 level of acceptance and i i was reading through some of the debates uh, back in 2015 16 and uh, the, a number of fears very legitimately um, held by people, expressed by people about what would happen then when we had medical assistance in dying as a reality. And then looking back after three or four years, seeing that those, those fears very fortunately uh, were, not, were not well founded. They were legitimately held, uh, but they, weren't, they didn't turn out to be 
uh, so in practice. So I think that's 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 Im that's important for us to know as we move forward and try to get get a better uh, medical assistance design regime in place. Well, certainly, uh, I, I think that's right, um, and and it is it does have the support of most Canadians, uh, the vast majority uh, from from the the work that we've done, the, con the consultations that we've done. So it's really it's really moving together pr prudently and moving together uh, prudently. Um, I got a wonderful letter uh, to the editor in, in La Presse uh, the day before yesterday. And, and uh, those kinds of testimonials make it all worth it. Yeah, well, that's very good. Well, it's well done. Anything else, Helen? No, I mean, yeah, I could stand for a couple more hours, but I think we'll be conscious of the minister's time. Um, just for the audience to know, we have responded to as many questions as we could. We will uh, put together an FAQ and send that out with a copy of the webinar. Uh, and we will include um, translation on the webinar for the French and the English parts for applicable audiences. So once it gets on the website, it'll look um, you'll have that available. So I think just to say thank you so much, Minister Lumetti, for uh, coming to talk to us directly today and answering some of those questions. I know we've certainly heard overwhelmingly um, from Canadians. Uh, you know, I, I saw the letter to the editor you referenced, but we've, we've had so many emails along those lines, just um, appreciated of the recognition of the compassion and the the right for personal autonomy that that this bill is continuing to give people and and I think recognition you spoke to um, the shift in thinking of Canadians recognition that that shift continues and that there's more work yet to do and more places to go so um, thank you and thank you for coming today we really appreciate it and thank you Senator Cowan for uh, for managing our question period thank you for managing me <laughs> thank, thank you. you minister thank so, you like we look forward to continuing working with you as we uh, work towards the same goals thanks so much absolutely thank you everyone thank okay. you everyone. thanks again to the audience uh, if you have any outstanding questions or concerns please email us at info at dyingwithdignity.ca and keep an eye out for the link uh, to the recording coming out shortly and have a great afternoon thanks everyone <laughs>